Okay, so I run a lab that uh, we work on computational modeling of blood flow in the cardiovascular system. And since uh, I came back to Stanford a couple of years ago, um, we have been, uh, we've started to take an interest in, in uh, assessing the hemodynamics in pulmonary hypertension patients. And uh, part of our motivation for doing this is that we, we know very well that altered hemodynamics uh, is a contributor to pH progression, and particularly thinking about uh, the elevated pulmonary pressures together with abnormal wall shear stress conditions, um, we'd like to have a better understanding of how those uh, hemodynamics contribute to vascular remodeling. Um, and in particular, We've really taken a step back and started to ask the question, what are the hemodynamic conditions in these patients? Uh, really thinking about um, a, a couple of different categories. So it, just to review, there is evidence that, uh, that hemodynamics is abnormal in the pulmonary arteries of pH patients. Um, and primarily, that's been looked at in the proximal pulmonary arteries. So there have been prior studies done here at Stanford. This is a study by Bev Tang, together with Charlie Taylor and Jeff Feinstein, um, looking primarily at the MPA and then the branch PAs, um, showing that the wall shear stress was uh, significantly decreased in the MPA uh, in pH compared to normal. Um, and continuing from that, we wanted to then sort of take this a step further and ask, well, what are the hemodynamic conditions not only in the proximal arteries, but looking down the entire pulmonary tree, uh, and then looking at two categories of patients who develop pH, the first being patients who develop pH secondary to congenital heart disease, for example, patients with a late or unrepaired VSD, um, and then also uh, in patients with IPH, um, looking at how the hemodynamics changes with disease progression. And so we're, we're using a computational modeling approach to do this. Um, using computational modeling uh, where we construct uh, patient-specific models directly from the image data, um, usually CT or MRI. Uh, and then part of our motivation for this is also uh, really wanting to make sure that we're doing the right experiments when we go to the lab and look at endothelial shear stress. Uh, and so we've been collaborating with Marlene Rabinovich uh, on that front and trying to really directly use some of the uh, mechanical data that we're getting, particularly on wall shear stress, and using that to drive sort of more precise uh, endothelial shear exp experiments where we can look at gene expression. Uh, our computational methods are typically starting from a CT or MRI scan uh, of a pH patient. Uh, we then draw centerline paths down the vessels, uh, all of the pulmonary vessels that we can reasonably see in the image data. Uh, we segment the lumen and we construct a, a pretty complex three-dimensional computer model of the pulmonary vasculature that looks like this. Um, we then use three-dimensional computational fluid dynamics uh, to model flow in these 3D models. Uh, the, the 3D CFD models are really used to model the proximal uh, PAs, so generally all the vessels that we can see in a CT scan down to about one millimeter in diameter. Uh, and just to remind everybody, so the equations that we're solving are really just the conservation of mass and momentum of the fluid going through the model. Um, we kind of borrow a lot of techniques that have been developed in more traditional engineering uh, fields to use a finite element method to solve these equations. Um, for each model, we tune the inlet and outlet boundary conditions to match a set of clinical data that's been collected for each of our patients. And we do include vessel wall deformation in our models. And where possible, we match uh, or we tune the material properties such that we match, uh, for example, deformation in the MPA that's observed or measured in MRI. Um, so we've really looked at two groups of patients here, and the, the two people who've done all of this work are sitting in the back, so we can also um, feel free to bother them for additional details. 
Um, so this first project was done by Melody Dong. Um, some of these results are still, uh, still preliminary. We're just uh, still getting started on some of this. Um, but our, our goal here was really to try to, to separate out and ask in a patient with, for example, an unrepaired VSD, what are the hemodynamic conditions in the PAs that may lead to initiation uh, of pH in these patients? Um, and so we took kind of a two-step approach here. We wanted to model both the hemodynamics in the proximal PAs as well as in the distal tree. And so we used the 3D modeling approach that I just told you about, building a model directly from the CT scan to examine the flow in the proximal vessels. And then at the outlet of each of these, uh, or at each outlet in the model here, we then construct a distal, a morphometric tree of the distal vasculature. So we'd like to be able to use then the 3D model to get the proximal vessels, and then this morphometric tree to get the entire distal tree downstream of that. Um, we solve the 3D model directly with CFD. Uh, and then the distal tree, we make a, a quasoy assumption, so we assume a parabolic flow profile and compute an estimate of the shear stress in all of those uh, vessels downstream. The um, morphometric trees uh, for right now are constructed from uh, this 96 paper by Wang. Um, these are more... Um, this is a morphometric data set for an adult uh, normal pulmonary tree. Uh, for the case of the diseased pH patients that you'll see later on, we have also been able to adapt this tree to do the kind of pruning that we see um, in pH. Uh, and we're currently investigating ways to scale this data for younger patients such as infants. Uh, so the first results that I'll show you are a normal pulmonary model. Uh, where we've then artificially altered the inlet conditions to account for or to, to model the case of a normal patient and then a 2 to 1 and a 3 to 1 uh, VSD uh, flow conditions. So these are the flow rates that you see here and then the mean PA pressures uh, in the model. And so again, our goal here, we're going to look at three different areas of the pulmonary arteries and um, looking at the wall shear stress that's experienced by the vessel wall uh, under these conditions. So, as, uh, so not surprisingly, if we just look at the MPA to start with, uh, the shear stress increases from about 5 to about 25 as you increase the flow rate from normal to a 3 to 1 uh, VSD. As you travel down to um, arteries that are less than 20 millimeters in diameter, we start to see uh, more significant elevations in shear stress. Uh, so going from uh, roughly 20 to 30 in the normal models that are shown by these red Xs uh, to say on the order of 50 or 60 for the two to one VSD and then getting closer to a uh, range of 100 um, for the 3 to 1 VSD. So we're starting to see some fairly elevated shear stress values at these higher flow rates. Uh, and then going to, in the morphometric tree, uh, vessels less than one millimeter, where, of course, it's thought that the disease uh, originates um, you can see that as we go smaller in diameter, we really start to get some severely elevated shear stress values in those distal PAs. So we're looking at values upwards of 100, 200 dynes per centimeter squared. Uh, we, we then wanted to go on and look at patients who have pH. How do these hemodynamic conditions change uh, over the course of disease? Um, and in particular, we wanted to use computational modeling for two different goals. Um, the first thing I'm going to tell you about, which was done by uh, Wei Guang, who's uh, also sitting in the back there, um, was to look at whether we could use a simple computational model of ventricular work, so right ventricular stroke work, to predict uh, disease progression or clinical worsening in these patients. And then we'll talk more about, uh, go back to the tree, uh, hemodynamics and look at shear stress. Um, 
So we, we all know that stroke work is the area enclosed inside of a pressure volume loop of the heart. Um, and so we had this idea that we could artificially produce a PV loop using a computational model. So just a simple circuit lump parameter model of the right ventricle. And so we decided to collect uh, from the Packard database working with Jeff Feinstein, uh, a set of data uh, for patients with pH over uh, who had both MRI and cath at multiple uh, time points. And, um, and we thought, well, we could evaluate the right ventricular stroke work and see if this is predictive of clinical worsening uh, in these patients. So for each patient, we used a lump parameter heart model to compute the right ventricular stroke work. We tuned the heart model to match the clinical data collected for the patient. Um, and we used both RV and PA pressures from right heart cath, as well as RV volumes uh, and PA flow from MRI to tune the model. Um, the model looks like this, so it's a circuit. The elements of this circuit are govern governed by a set of ordinary differential equations. We can integrate these in a, in a simple code, like in MATLAB. Um, and the outputs of this are basically um, uh, the PV loop where we can compute the RV stroke work. Um, in order to tune the model uh, to match the clinical data, we performed an optimization method. And uh, in the study, we had uh, 17 patients with a total of 61 data points because each patient had multiple time points uh, that we looked at. Uh, these were all patients under 18 who had IPAH or uh, pH uh, due to congenital heart disease. Um, and we classified these into a stable group and a worsening group. Um, and so we had, I think, five in the uh, stable group and seven in the worsening group. Uh, we define clinical worsening as uh, death listed or considered for transplantation uh, or poor hemodynamic response to maximal therapy. Um, and so this is just to give you a qualitative idea of how the RV stroke work changes over, uh, over the years of, since diagnosis for these patients. So you can see that the pa for the patients who had a relatively stable clinical course, their RV stroke work remained uh, relatively stable, uh, usually over several years. However, the patients that were classified in the clinical worsening group generally had uh, RV stroke work values that climbed quite steeply um, and also were on average quite a bit higher uh, than in the stable group. And so we looked at uh, statistics, so we grouped uh, for each data point in our data set, we looked at an outcome two years after that and then grouped uh, those into uh, stable and worsening. And we did show that we were able to predict clinical worsening um, significantly using RV stroke work. And this was quite a bit better than, for example, the prediction value we were able to get with PVRI and a number of other uh, currently used clinical metrics that we looked at. And so uh, we found that RV stroke work outperformed other standard clinical metrics used to predict the need for a heart transplant uh, in these patients. And this is just uh, coming out uh, soon in pulmonary circulation. Okay, so getting back to our question about how do the hemodynamics change as you go down the tree and also as you progress uh, in terms of disease severity in these patients. Uh, and so we took our RV lump parameter model, we hooked it up to our three-dimensional computational fluid dynamics model, and then using the same approach that I talked about before, we constructed morphometric trees, uh, a, a separate tree for each outlet of our uh, three-dimensional model to model the dis distal pulmonary vasculature. Um, Wei Guang modeled five controls and then four patients with uh, moderate pH and six patients with severe pH in the study. And you can see 
their ages and some of their uh, clinical data like ejection fraction and PVRI in this table. Uh, Wei Gong built uh, three-dimensional three anatomic models for all of these patients and ran uh, CFD simulations with fluid structure interaction to account for the, the vessel wall deformation. Um, for all of the pH patients, we tuned the material properties of the wall to match uh, MRI-derived uh, deformation values. And so we wanted to then see both in the proximal PAs and in the distal PAs, how do the hemodynamics vary uh, with disease severity compared to control. So this is looking at the wall shear stress in the MPA looking at the control group versus the moderate pH and the severe pH. Uh, so as expected and in agreement with the previous data, we do see a significant decrease in wall shear stress uh, in the MPA. Um, looking at the branch PAs, uh, we do see a decrease in the severe patient group, um, and the other two are relatively similar. Looking at oscillatory shear index, so this is the degree of oscillatory flow uh, in these vessels. We do see a significant increase in the MPA in terms of oscillatory flow in the severe group uh, and little change, sorry, this keeps going on and off. Uh, we, see, we don't see any significant change uh, in the branch PAs in terms of oscillatory flow. Uh, we also looked at wall strain. Since we're doing fluid structure interaction, we could look at the wall deformation. Uh, and we found that wall strain was uh, decreased, but not with statistical significance. Um, although we also saw quite a bit of variation among the different patients. In particular, we had an outlier who was very young and likely had much more elastic vessels than the rest of the group. Um, the trend overall was that we saw a decrease in wall strain and then an increase, and this is really due to the balance of the stiffening of the vessel walls against the increasing pulmonary pressure. Looking at the distal vessels is where things start to get uh, really interesting because I think uh, people have primarily been focused on this data that's come out showing this, the shear stress has decreased in the main pulmonary arteries. But what we see in these, in pH patients, particularly with increasing severity, is severely elevated shear stress in the distal pulmonary vasculature. And so if we're, cons if we're thinking about the endothelial response uh, in the PA vessels, particularly where we get the disease originating in the distal vasculature, I think what we really need to be looking at is, uh, is what happens to the endothelial cells under, under severely elevated shear stress. And what we're seeing uh, in our models, again, by looking at the uh, morphometric trees and estimating the shear stress at different sized vessels, uh, is we're seeing values upwards of 100 in the, say, 2, 3, 400 range. And these are values that have not been previously looked at experimentally. Uh, in the context of pH, and so we're now collaborating with uh, Marlene's group uh, to start doing some experiments, um, and they've already got some, some interesting data uh, along these lines. Um, and so again, just what you're seeing here is these are cumulative distribution plots, so what you're seeing is a probability uh, that a vessel in this side, size range will have a shear stress of this value. So for example, 80% probability that the vessels in the uh, moderate group will have a shear stress of 20. Over here you can see we're really getting severely elevated values, uh, especially in the severe group uh, in the you know, several hundred dynes per centimeter squared range. Uh, so, just to close, um, I think our data is in agreement with prior data that wall shear stress is decreased in the proximal vessels with increasing disease severity, but we believe it's markedly elevated in the distal PA vasculature with values upwards of 100 dynes per centimeter squared. 
Uh, and this is likely uh, has implications for initiation of pH, for example, in patients with uh, congenital heart disease. And then we see these values increasing even more with disease severity when we look at patients with progressively worsening pH. Uh, so we believe that computational modeling can provide preci more precise data to guide sort of what are the targeted endothelial gene expression studies that we should be looking at. I'll just close by saying that I think uh, another direction that we're going in is to start looking at vascular growth and remodeling and how we can incorporate those processes directly into our computational models. Uh, so what, uh, we're collaborating with Jay Humphrey at Yale uh, to try to merge some of these tools together and the vision that we have is that we can uh, eventually do a CFD study that gives us pressure and wall shear stress distribution, pass that to a structured growth solver where we can grow the vessel wall in response to those stresses right in the model, give that updated geometry back to the solver and loop through this process of altered flow conditions, vessel wall growth, increasingly altered flow conditions, uh, et cetera. And so I'm very interested in applying some of those tools to the context, in the context of this disease. Uh, we also have an open source project, so all of the modeling capabilities and tools that I've talked about are available uh, at simvascular.org for other research groups, and we would love other people to use them and contribute to them. Uh, and I will just end by acknowledging particularly Melody and Wei Guang, who are sitting in the back, as, as well as Jeff Feinstein, Marlene Rabinovich, and Frandix Chan, who were involved in the clinical uh, side of this project. Thanks, happy to take questions. Um, so the, in terms of resolution of the simulation, they're quite well resolved and we usually do a mesh convergence study. So we end up with finite element meshes with usually several million elements. Um, I don't remember exactly their size, but essentially we get a, you know, three components of velocity and pressure throughout the model. Um, In terms of the vessel, um, I mean, we're solving a conti a, the continuum equation, so I'm, I'm not sure that, I think the question is more whether the simulation is resolved than really what the resolution is. I wouldn't say we can, I mean, it depends on the question you're trying to answer in terms of how fine you want, like, cellular response at the vessel wall. Um, but they are, they are converged, that, that we've done. <laughs> uh, usually a, a couple of hours to days of compute time. So we run these on uh, both a local cluster here at Stanford as well as a XSEED cluster, one of the national supercomputing centers. So it usually takes, I don't know, um, 10 hours on multiple cores. Allison, really well done. Um, is, is the goal eventually for you to be able to look at treatment response so for example, is, is the model dynamic enough that you could take a vasoreactive idiopathic patient who on 30 seconds of nitric oxide will substantially re reduce their PVR, improve their pulmonary uh, compliance, um, and, and maybe study them and then model what a superb response would be, and then either use it as a predictive or a supportive uh, model to decide on therapy? I, I wonder if you can um, mm -hmm. speculate on that a little bit. So I guess the direction we've started out going is, is more from the point of view of could we predict disease progression and also could we understand exactly what forces the vessel walls are experiencing. But I do think we could simulate the type of scenario that you're talking about. The, the challenge there is really, you know, how a pharmacological treatment would affect something like PVR. So we can, we can change PVR at will in the model um, and then simulate the resulting conditions. You have phenotypes that, um, that, that, that's the point, is that they have, sorry. They have so, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is something I think we could do and would be interesting. So yeah. I'm a pediatric cardiologist and I'm curious what do you think about the treat and repair strategy in the patients with borderline PVR? Because I always, I mean, a lot of people do it, but I sometimes feel, you know, you're giving a vasodilator to someone with an open shunt and you probably increase the flow to the pulmonary mm -hmm. vascular tree possibly mm -hmm. decreasing pressure, but increasing flow. What happens to the shear stress in such a situation? Yeah, so I mean, you're gonna increase, anytime you're increasing flow, you're gonna correspondingly increase shear stress, and then you're gonna drive a response in the vessel wall. So exactly, and that response is gonna vary depending where you are in the tree. So in the proximal tree, um, you know, you may get at, at least, so for example, with increasing pressure, you're gonna, you would expect this kind of dilation in the, in the proximal vessels and constriction in the distal vessels that we see in pH patients. So we would have to kind of tease out you know, what would be the expected remodeling response. In, so in, you can think about conditions where you're just increasing flow or you're increasing both flow and pressure or you're just increasing pressure, but. And if you um, manage to de decrease pressure and increase flow, would that be good or bad? Um, I'm not sure we're far enough along in the growth and remodeling uh, sort of a pipeline to definitively answer that question. But that's what people who are arguing yeah. for treat and repair is arguing yeah. that it might be better to Increase flow well, and decrease pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's beautiful work. I have a question that's a little bit off topic. Uh, I was wondering if the uh, shear, shear stress you're detecting in the distal vessels would be sufficient to cause red blood cell lysis. Uh, and I ask because we and some other groups now have, have found elevated cell free hemoglobin uh, in patients with PAH and it appears to be specific to PAH rather than pulmonary venous hypertension. Uh, and we've got some unpublished data showing that the gradient of self hemoglobin goes up across the pulmonary circulation in PAH compared with controls. And, uh, you know, as you, as you showed the, the older data suggesting that there's low shear stress until, you know, you, you showed your new data, we didn't have an explanation for that. But the inference is that there might be some low-level lysis across the circulation. Yeah, so I mean, we were definitely quite surprised by how high the shear stress values are. And so it would not surprise me greatly if there are in the range that could cause lysis. We'd have to, um, I don't know if Wei Guang, if you've computed strain rates, we'd ha we could look at strain rates uh, in those vessels and see you know, if they're in that range. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, they're high enough that we were quite surprised by how, just how high. Andy had another question, and we have one from the audience. Okay. All right, and I might have missed something, but um, I'm trying to wrap my head around why the shear stress is so high in the distal vessels. Um, and you might have already shown this, but was this a consistent phenomenon to a similar degree, both in the less severe pH and the severe pH? And if so, is it safe to presume that the patients with severe pH had more severe pruning so why, are, why would that effect be similar? You'd think you'd see less of a rise in distal shear stress in the less severe, less pruned patients. Or, and so, so how I do think, we explain this, I guess? I think what's going on is you're driving, you're driving a whole lot of flow through very few vessels. And so as long as your cardiac output is still in the normal range, you're really forcing all of that flow through not only fewer vessels, but vessels that are constricted, that are smaller. And so that's going to elevate the shear stress in those. I guess what I'm asking is a continuum from the, mm -hmm. as the pH got more severe. So we see, I mean, even in the normal model uh, that I showed, we see, the ver we, we do see relatively high shear stress in the distal vessels, and then that gets increasingly higher in the moderate cases and then in the severe case. So uh, 
In the moderate case, I guess you may have some pruning and some restriction, and then that gets even more pruning and more restrictive diameters. So both the pruning and the diameter restriction are going to elevate the shear because... Yes, As, uh, if the cardiac output starts to drop, it'll start to go down again. And then just um, one question from the audience. Can you predict with your simulation models the invasive diastolic transpulmonary gradient um, a that's, um, that should be independent of the RV stroke volume and which distinguishes precapillary from postcapillary palmar hypertension? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what we always okay. know. Okay. Um, yes. Well, we need, so we need some, we need cath data to tune the model, meaning we can't, we can't use the model as a substitute for a cath. Okay. So, um, I think we would be using some of this data to tune our boundary conditions, if I'm correctly understanding the question. Okay, so I don't know whether it was someone um, from the audience sitting here or, okay, maybe we can talk. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh.